Our, our second presentation will be by um, the Modernization Agency of the NHS, and Caroline will explain what is the, um, the function of the Modernization Agency. I'd li just like to introduce Caroline um, Corrigan, who is Director of HR Development in the Modernization Agency, and um, Yasir um, Samir, who is the Chief Information Officer. Uh, both in the Modernization Agency, there are a lot of changes happening, and I think some of this is going to come through um, in a moment. Uh, what was interesting is how this thing came about. Um, where uh, I'm also, you probably um, know I wear several hats, and one of them is I'm involved with the Society for Organizational Learning. And one of Caroline's um, colleagues, uh, we were waiting to go into a meeting. Um, she asked me what I was doing, and I explained. In fact, we were doing some work with Rolls Royce uh, Marine at the time. So she pricked up her ears and she said, Oh, I think we'd be very interested to hear that. In due course, we had a, a, a breakfast meeting in Helsinki, and then the rest <laughs> followed. Um, I get, uh, but I, again, I think you see the possibilities, having that vision to see what can be done in a different way. Great, thank you very much, Eve. Um, I was uh, just reflecting uh, just over coffee with uh, a couple of people around um, that, that sense of opportunity and possibilities, and, and indeed during the Rolls Royce presentation, I wrote down a long list of similarities. Um, you probably couldn't get two organisations that look on paper um, to be worlds apart from each other, but what I, the benefit of going second, but also um, what I hope to do is draw out some of those similarities. The first thing that struck me was the opportunity, the possibility, and that sense of, as, as he's just reflected, because of a conversation, in effect, we got into this project. Those, of course, the, the realities within the organisation of getting board sign up and, and other areas, which I will touch on. But the first thing I wanted to just reflect on was that sense, and I think I, I, I got some of that from, from colleagues in, in, in Rolls-Royce, of, hang on, I see this as an opportunity. I see this as helping us on our journey. I see this as something that can contribute to uh, the development of this organisation and then being able then to bring it in and, and gain ownership within the organisation to, to continue that. So I just wanted to flag up that, that reflection of um, you know, it, it happened over a breakfast meeting. It's very good value for money, so it's an easy way to sort of bring it into the organisation as well. Um, but also that, that, that point about opportunity. Um, I've got a few slides. Um, and I, I think much like colleagues will, will um, gallop through them um, and because in the interest of, suppose, uh, opening up dialogue and discussion. I think much like colleagues from Rolls-Royce are very keen to um, take reflections and, and, and take challenge from, from the group here today. I suppose particularly because we're right at the point of standing back, reflecting, and saying, what do we want to do with this next? We're, we're at the point of analysis, but there's a few other things in our cosmos that have changed as well. So right in the middle of saying what's, what is the next step, reflecting on our learning to date. And it's been incredibly helpful to listen to, to, to the journey that, that, that you've undertaken so far. Ours is a, a shorter lifetime in this project, but as I say, the list of similarities is, um, is uh, for me, was just, uh, was just great. So what I thought I'd be doing is, is covering the sort of who we are and why ICOS. Martin, it's not just about breakfast meetings and opportunities, but a, a digging in a bit in terms of what did we see as the opportunity and the possibility with, in effect, the melding of the IPOS project with our organisation's development. Some of the methodology in terms of what we've undertaken so far, what we've learned as we've um, gone through those, those tools and techniques and what we think we might be doing next. Um, some of the interim findings, what it is we think the analysis is telling us and therefore what does that point us to in terms of understanding of the dilemmas, assumptions, what is it we think the action uh, will look like. Some of the actions we've taken in the interest of either quick wins or, um, or also you don't, you don't need to wait in effect in order to take some of the action. Um, as I said, what, what we think we're going to be doing next, um, but importantly for me, what is it we're learning? What is it that we, and I mean the royal we, I suppose, what is it I'm learning? What is it that we're learning as, as groups? What is it we're learning as an organisation at this point in our life? Um, at this point in terms of the journey that we're on. And then at, at the end there, much, much like we've done before, just a, a good opportunity for, 
questions, reflections, challenges, um, and, and answers. <laughs> and any answers on the, I, I will be bringing uh, colleagues in on those. Um, a bit about who we are, and you probably saw um, Yasir and I just scribbling a couple of flip charts as well, because there's something about the benefit of coming second. Um, you can, you can uh, gauge a little bit about the audience and think about a couple more things to add. Very simply, uh, we're an organisation as part of the NHS that was established in April 2001. And the thing that established us, or that um, created us, was the NHS plan. Um, the first time ever the NHS has had a strategic plan, ever. Um, a ten-year plan, which Alan Milburn, who was the uh, uh, Minister for Health, um, uh, brought about, brought together as a simple document, simple-ish document, to describe this is our vision for the NHS, this is the government's vision for the NHS, this is the improvement we're going to see in the NHS, and this is the ten-year journey. And it's still quite a cornerstone, so something that we other you know people across the NHS um, still reflect back on and, and interestingly because it's the first time we've ever had it ever had anything that described something that was a journey rather than um, uh, something which moved e e every election time I'll come back to that um, as it's uh, it's uh, it, it, it's of course changed we are an organisation of 750 people-ish, um, we call it whole time equivalent, there's a sort of head count actually is around 1,000 people. 1,000 people that are sort of associated with this, this organisation and we, we have a budget of 230 million aimed at improvement for the NHS. Now if I just touch on the NHS and a bit about the Department of Health to give you a sense of us within the context of the system we're working within, and then some of the things I'll talk about is us as a system within a system. Um, the last triangle at the bottom there, so just so it doesn't distract, is a bit about the work. What is it we actually do? If, we work, if we're about modernisation or we're about improvement in the NHS, how do we do that? And I'll, I'll, I'll come on to that. But just a little bit in terms of context about the NHS. And I'll do that very much from the, hopefully from the bottom up. Um, a million employees... HR person, easy to talk about um, uh, people, uh, the people dimension to begin with. So if you can imagine working as part of an organisation that's a million employees, we represent about a thousand of those million employees. And our work and our efforts um, pre-2001 and continuing past next year has always been dedicated at improving services for patients. Looking at patients, looking at services provided for patients and saying we can do it better. Now, critically, around these sort of time frames, significant input, injection of cash into the NHS. Labour government manifesto, we will improve um, NHS services, we recognise the uh, lack of um, investment to date, and we will invest. And we, the public, will see an improvement. We as patients, we as carers, we as people who, all, who have family, who um, will always know a patient, we will see, as a member of the voting public, an improvement in the NHS. That's roughly, you know, roughly the territory we're talking about. And here is my five boxes that describe the NHS. You can imagine a million employees. Starting at the bottom, we as patients, we as members of the public, we as taxpayers who are injecting this extra money into, into the NHS, can access our GP surgeries, can access our local um, A&E um, and hospital services. And they're um, grouped together on a patch called a strategic health authority. And England is basically separated up into 28 areas and you've got 28 SHAs. So each of our GP surgeries or our hospitals, primary, secondary care, whatever health and social care, or maybe health uh, care intervention um, and support is grouped into an area and then the country split by 28. Simple, simplest way I could do it. If you can imagine, though, a GP surgery can be single-handed. If you can imagine a hospital can be for 8,000 employees. The variety in terms of the system is enormous. Um, my experience, I've been working in the NHS for about 12 years now. My route through was um, HR uh, predominantly, and um, I, I worked at hospital level, director of HR for an organisation of about 5,000 employees. So it's a, that, as one organisation, as part of a system of a million, gives you a sense of, sense of the scale or how it is we can try and simplify it to understand how it works. So 28 SHAs. 
And then you've got the Department of Health and ministers in terms of, you've got the NHS and then you've got clearly a, 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 a a minister and a department um, that, that uh, in effect, funding flows through. What's interesting, though, is that each of those hospitals particularly, and some primary care trusts, have their own chief executives. So these are organisations, these are employing bodies in their own rights under a sort of framework of uh, NHS um, uh, employment. But individual organisations help bound together as NHS. 28, so Jane, let's say Department of Health. Now, the reason I'm flagging out the Department of Health is that's, that's the people that fund us. Out of all of the money that comes through the government for health, and I'm afraid I've lost track of the, um, the, the figure it stands at the moment. I have 60 billion in my head. Um, uh, the Department of Health basically funnels that money through the SHAs into, into hospitals. But also this way. There are a number of organisations, arms length bodies, as they're, as they're grouped together and known at the moment, and, and we are classed as one of those. So we're not a direct care provider. We're not a GP, we're not a, a primary care trust, we're not a hospital. We're something that's set up nationally, and our job, along with a couple of other organisations, is about improvement. How do we improve this system to make it better for patients? There are other organisations along here, I think it's about 44 of them, um, who are about inspection, who are about um, setting standards, quality, uh, so regulation, inspection, and improvement. You sort of cluster it in that way. Because clearly, with a system of a million people, let alone the number of patients that the NHS deals with, there's some things which you would want to group up nationally, some things which you do want to leave lo um, uh, locally. Um, and it's that sort of framework in which we're operating. So for one of these national bodies, 230 million, make it better for patients. Make it better for each one of us as the taxpayer to know that you're getting better, better services in any, any uh, uh, NHS establishment. That's enough of that. Hopefully that's enough of context um, to give you a sense of who we are within the system in which we operate. In terms of our work, so if we're one of the group, we're one of the band of merry men that are um, focused on improvement in the NHS, how do we do that? Well, we focus on um, redesigning processes. We focus on redesigning roles for the people, for employees of the NHS, and we're more and more, more and more focusing on how do you take the benefit from technology to improve patients for services, services for patients. The common word in all of that is improving services for patients. However you do it, we need to show improvement. Some examples of our work, and then I'll, I'll, I'll move into um, uh, sort of the ICOS work and what we're doing. This gives you a flavour for people, process, and technology. Um, there are something called star rating systems. It's in education, basically league tables. This is one way of understanding it of rating your local hospital. Zero star, one star, two star, three star. Three star is great. Zero star, mm, there's a problem, and uh, their performance needs to be improved. So we are the organisation who go in and help those organisations move up and improve their performance. So a, a, a hospital trust that has failed in some way um, to meet its performance targets across a, a balanced scorecard range of things that um, hospitals are assessed on, we have a team of specialist experts, um, world class, um, who are a um, professional turnaround um, team. We'll come into those organisations, we'll help the leadership team and improve its performance in the context of that uh, performance rating. At another end of the spectrum, though, was one of the key government targets for all of this money going into the NHS was saying, you will not wait longer than four hours when you go into an A&E department. That was a, that's the target, that's a demonstration to us, the British voting uh, taxpaying public, that things are improving is that you will, you will not spend longer than, than, than four hours. So one of, our, one of our, our groups of work was to set up um, a, an emergency services collaborative, and I'll touch on collaboratives again in a moment, to um, improve performance across the NHS in England. That's now standing at 94%. We're just about nudging 98% of all hospital trusts within England, and now at this sort of 94, 98, well, I think we're just broken the 98% uh, performance target. Um, 
Another area of work is uh, Cancer Services Collaborative, and Andrew, I was um, one of our uh, uh, leaders in, in that area. I just asked Anne, because she came along today to listen, but I'm just going to rope her in and say, so if you can just give the audience a little bit of context around the Cancer Services Collaborative, and I, I've, I've asked Anne to do this to give a sort of practical sense of what is our, our work on a day-to-day -day basis. Thanks, Anne. Could I just ask you to... The Cancer Services Collaborative started in 2001 when the new organisation of the Modernisation Agency came along. And it's one of the chapters in the 10 year plan, mm -hmm. so it's not nothing separate. It's funded by the policy team, uh, just as Caroline said. But to complicate things, the context that it works in is that there's another structure that's mm -hmm. added here, which is called a cancer network. And in England, there are 34 of them. And the cancer networks are made up of these trusts and the PCTs. But they're not necessarily all coterminous, because what makes the cancer network different, it is based on what's known as patient flows. And the reason for that is that even though you may live in one area, if you have got suspected cancer or actual cancer, you not, don't always get treated because it's not a specialty within that area. So you may go across a boundary to another area or to another hospital that's not within your allocated area. So it's another structure that the, that the work that the Cancer Services Collaborative has to deal with. The, as we said, it started in 2001, and at the, at the time, what we were doing, we first tested the methodology, and the methodology is almost spot on the same as what Ross Royce was doing, that we process mapped, we analysed the current situation, we looked for the evidence, then we said, right, what is the things that we need to do for the for cancer patients, where are the gaps, why is this service being ineffective? We did a vision, did it fit with the overall cancer plan? Yes. And then what we did in phase one, which is 2001, we tested within the cancer networks and these trusts, we tested our change out before we put it out and, and it rolled it out across the NHS. And we came, the, what was very much the people who tested it were the people who worked in hospitals. It was your doctors, it was your nurses, it was administration staff, it was your porters. They tested it for us. All we did was facilitate them and help them with the methodology, the process mapping, how to do the analysis, how to do the capacity and demand, how to look at leadership. And one of the things that was important is that we needed to get ownership of these ideas right from the beginning. And actually, the ideas actually came from the staff. It didn't come from us. And in fact, to make one of the things, and Caroline may not like me saying this, but it's true, one of the things that the agency does, we nick ideas. Mm. We nick ideas that happen down mm. here. And, but what we do, we pull the innovation up, mm. and we refine it, and then that's when we start to spread it. So phase two of the Cancer Collaborative is that we've got all these ideas that have been tested within nine cancer networks and we focused on five core tumours, that was five cancers that are very, very common in, in the UK. And what we then said, these are the things that really can make a difference to these patients and we wanted to get it rolled out across all the hospitals, but this was very much centrally driven, it was very top down. We were saying, this is what you need to do. Now that was quite difficult because it had already been tested but we still needed to get the ownership and roll out further. But once again, it was going through the same methodology over and over again with different organisations, different people. And we found that even though we knew what was working, each trust, each SHA, each cancer network was different. There was different professional boundaries, there were different champions, there was different leaders, different attitudes, there was some very much, very traditional, very entrepreneurial, very, I don't care, but let's have a go. Some just do it, some know you've got to do a business case first. But at the end of the day, the main driver was the patient. And you, there was nothing that we could get away from, but we kept bringing it back. The reason why you're doing this 
is to make improvement for patients. And nobody could argue with that. And nobody could argue when we showed the analysis, which was the evidence-based practice, that this is where the improvements were, were being um, taken forward. So phase two, we spread it. And we spread it to all the cancer networks. We are now in phase three which started 2003, and it runs to the end of the cancer plan, which is 2006. What we're doing now is sustainability and further rollout. And we're taking it right down to all the trusts, primary care, palliative care, and also now looking at the other tumours that we didn't look at in, in phase two. So where we concentrated on what we call the big five, there's now the other tumours that perhaps aren't big numbers in relation to the other, but just as equally important. But what's different now, we've got the ownership, we've localised it, we've put a service improvement lead in every cancer network. Okay, so we've actually made sure that we're getting some sustainability, some ownership, and these networks now have took total control over it. And we're now pulled in, basically, as a consultancy, as perhaps trouble, troubleshooting, new, new area, can you help us get kick-started? And that is how we're rolling out and how we're sustained. They do monthly reports nationally so that we can monitor how we're having an impact on access targets, which is one of the government's drivers, to make sure patients do get in within two weeks' wait, to make sure that patients are seen from when they're first referred to treatment within 62 days. We can't get away from that. But one of the biggest drivers as well is the quality of, of the patient, what we call the patient's journey. Because one of the things that we felt very important about is that you can get a tick in the box that you've hit the target, but the journey the patient's gone through could be absolutely awful. And so it's very much quality driven, patient focused, and as I said, phase three now belongs to these people. So our role has totally changed. Thanks so much, Thank Anne. The last um, bullet there was just to talk about the, uh, another aspect of our work around the Changing Workforce programme. I think Anne's picked some of that up in the sense of it's another programme, another activity area under the umbrella of the Modernisation Agency, which deliberately sets out to redesign uh, the roles of um, employees within the NHS. Again, aimed at improving uh, services for patients, but doing that in a different way. Uh, rather than sticking with some of the boundaries, particularly some professional boundaries. I won't go on, on to that. That gives you an example of, a, of, of our work. Um, if you can imagine there's 100, well, I think we've, one way of categorising it is that that's 156 activity areas. The Cancer Services Collaborative is a massive component of that. We've got about 156 activities going on. Can cancer Services Collaborative is one of those 156. It just gives you a sense of activity in this umbrella of the Modernisation Agency. So why ICOS? Um, I'll, I'll go back to that, that frame of um, uh, umbrella. The agency was created in April 2001, but not from a blank piece of paper. Improvement wasn't not happening in the NHS. There were entrepreneurs, there were people already in the NHS saying, we want to make it better. And why don't we just group together, or why don't we do it like this, or why can't I just share my learning with you? What we did, though, by creating the agency in 2001 is find a home for those people and say, we will give you an umbrella organisation, continue your work, continue to learn, spread it, make it sustainable, let's grow it, let's see what we need to do for the future. But it became a home for those entrepreneurs. It became a home for improvement that was happening in the, in, in the NHS, but a way of saying, well, bring it here and let's make it happen for everybody. Why is it only happening in Norfolk? Why is it only happening in Gateshead? How is it that, so one way of doing that was to bundle it together under, under this organisation. Drilling down a little bit, um, roughly that means there were seven, seven teams that came together and each of those teams had their leader. Um, each of those teams had people who were running their own organisations who then came into this national organisation. And what we did though, um, um, the chief executive appointed at the time said, I am not going to restructure this organisation. You, this group, fine, carry on doing what you're doing. That leader though, come and be part of this board. And there was a board created that represented those teams. So at the time, there's very much a sense of this is a federal organisation. 
these are teams, these are people, these are entrepreneurs. We do not want to restructure and create new leaders. We like what you're doing. We like the leadership here. This makes sense. Federation of organisations, surely we'd be able to you know, cross-fertilise the learning in a better way. In September 2003, as part of the sort of the life of the organisation in this sense of all the other things that were happening in terms of the development of the organisation within this system, was we thought that a good thing to do would be to create the senior management team. In effect, the top 70, 70 high flyers, the, the key leaders, people like Anne, um, who we felt wanted to come together because there was a sense of we want to know what's going on across this organisation. Uh, you know, out of my, my curiosity, out of not wishing to duplicate, out of surely there's a better way of accelerating the learning. Well, if we brought that team together, gosh, that, that, that would be a very powerful team to have together to drive the organisation forward. What was clear to us by 2002, coming into 2003, was this organisation will change, but we are not going to restructure. This organisation needs to change, but we don't quite know how and what that might look like. But we think a key leadership group, besides any board, would be important to the development of that organisation. So we set up something called the senior management team. And at that, that was literally at the point where I bumped into Eve. And the conversation we had made so much sense to me in terms of what, I, what we're talking about as an organisation is evolving. What we're talking about is some sense of co-creating that involvement, really desperately trying not to restructure, because one thing the NHS does very well is keep restructuring itself. Because ministers, let alone others, will say, well, the answer to the solution is, well, we can just wipe that tear out and do this, or can we make it look like that or make it look like this? And we're going through a bit of that at the moment. Um, there's the, 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 this group that we're part of, 44 of them, you've probably seen in the press around less civil servants, get them out of London, less uh, less bureaucracy. Well, if you reduce the number of these bodies and half the number of people, well, there you go. That's a good message for the public, reducing that, reducing that burden. Um, we, we knew that change was on the horizon, not just because of the politics and not just because of what was going on in the system, but because of what this organisation needed to be for the future. We knew ourselves we needed to change. What we thought we wanted to do was a, a way in which that um, evolved, a, a way in which um, would make it sustainable for the future. And, and as I say, the shorthand was, surely we can do it better than restructuring. So um, uh, from a conversation and good value for money, we were able to commission um, uh, Eve and the team to work with us to reflect on those development needs of this group. Because that's, that's, that's the way we positioned it originally, was, um, hang on, if we focused on this group as a key leadership group and as the, uh, the, 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 the steer for the future, then this project offered a way of, of reflecting on those development needs. Bingo, though. Um, suddenly, we, the, out of all of this mess comes a message, actually, the modernisation agency isn't going to exist. We're not going to exist as of April next year. And uh, the solution is um, we will localise our work. Now, at least, you know, the good message here is we're not, uh, this isn't a cost-cutting initiative back up here. It's not looking at one of us as one of these 44 bodies and saying, sorry, reduce your number by half and localise yourself somewhere else in the UK. It was, we want to ring-fence the money for improvement, but localise it. Let's not show it in a national organisation. The people and the money should be localised within trust, within SHAs. So, as we're thinking about our future development, and we were talking about... Well, localising our work, phase three of the plan was always going to be. If you take those 156 activity areas, well, they were at different stages in their development. Well, we've all got to come up to a line, basically, dissolve ourselves in April next year. There will be some sort of successor organisation, but we're right in the middle of saying, well, what does that successor organisation need to do for the system? What, what's the point of having it? What, what, would, what would NHS staff, let alone patients, say, well, that's a good thing to have? You'd want that in the future. But what it's not going to be is a large national organisation. It'll be something else. So, you know, in the life of any of our organisations, um, you've always got to deal with these things. Something happens, something <coughs> comes offside. So what we thought we'd be doing with the IPOS project suddenly shifted in terms of, well, we're still talking the same thing. We're still talking about evolving the organisation. We're still to wanting to do that in a way in which engages people and creates that um, very differently for the future. Um, but maybe we'll sort of, to make sense for the organisation, well, perhaps we'll talk about the transition of our current work and the design of the new organisation. How can these methodologies, tools, techniques help us in that, in that journey? 
Um, that, so that's, that was my, uh, just a reminder to me around um, what I meant by that. Methodology, colleagues have talked about, um, even the team helped us very much on this. We'd already started a process of um, semi-structured one-to-one, so that interview process with those 70 senior managers um, and some team interviews. We're, we're still going through some of the, the, the team interview process. Kate um, helped us with landscape of the mind questionnaires and um, recently we've um, picked up the netmap tools as well. I'll ask Guess here in a moment just to sort of t t touch on that very briefly, I'm just conscious of time. Um, one thing I would like to flag up here though, and just, just bearing in mind the discussion previously, was how to break into this. How is it an organisation says IPOS makes sense to us, how is it you get buy-in? Well, one of the key, I think, buy-ins for this organisation at this time has been the, uh, the landscape of the mind pro uh, questionnaires. Because at a point of change, at a point of individual change, as, you're, as, you, as you are told as an employee of this organisation, well, it's not going to exist in April next year, lots of questions about, well, can I pay my mortgage next year? What am I going to be doing? What is my future career direction? Actually, the LOM stuff has helped us in, in um, um, helping those conversations, but also see some of the patterns that exist that within our organisation. What is it we currently are? If we're going to, tr if we're going to make the transition of our work effective... We're not going to lose the gain of all this hard work that we've been doing for the past few years. If we're going to design the right organisation for the system and for the future, then we need to understand what we are. We need to understand how we operate, and not just in structural terms. In process terms, yes, but actually what are the behaviours and patterns that exist within our organisation that we want to build upon, either in transiting and localising our work or in the design of the new organisation. Um, I'll come back to NetMap in a moment. We've then had, um, as a result of the um, interviews and some of the analysis of that, we've had a reflect back workshop. So the opportunity for those 70 senior managers to come back in and validate in effect and, and hear within the, the sort of framework of the theory, what is it that um, those interviews are telling us around our assumptions, around the dilemmas that we face. But it's almost the triangulation of this data, of the analysis, that's been the most powerful thing, that sense of here it is. Here it is in black and white, here it is, this is what you're saying, this is what you're thinking, can we validate that through this reflect back workshop? Again, it has felt, um, we wouldn't have known it was impor as important as, as it was, um, and will continue to be, I think. The core group was set up as a, uh, after the reflect back workshop to take forward, well, so what? Now we've had that workshop, now we've looked at the analysis, now we've argued with each other, because another key feature of this organisation, if you can imagine out of a million empo employees, We've gathered 750, and some would say of the best, in terms of improvement and improvement approaches, improvement theory, then there's quite a few people versed in complexity. There's quite a few people versed in OD theories, in, in, in all sorts of methodologies. And often part of the, um, the uh, one of the features of this organisation is we will argue the toss over whose theory is right, let alone what the data says. But we can get lost in arguing over the theory and completely miss the point around um, validating what, what, the, what, what the data is telling us. Um, complexity seminars, just to sort of, and that for me is really the sort of validation of it's okay to have different theories and it's okay, we're, let's argue about that. that, that's absolutely fine, let's understand the territory that we're talking about in terms of the, the theoretical context. And uh, we've set up a process, I think probably because of the change that we know we're going through, we are not going to exist next year, more people are interested in one-to-one -one feedback around what does long mean for me, not just for the organisation. Some of the findings, um, uh, I was arguing with somebody around caveat on findings, it was like, well, you know, the world was going to change, so why don't we just accept it to change? But I suppose that the majority of the study was undertaken prior to this announcement that we're not going to exist, but that doesn't not validate it. it it's, it's, um, some people feel that there's a strong need for caveats around the sort of, well, where, where is it we came from? Actually, we're on a journey and this is, this is where we've been and this is where we are. What we did find as a result of the um, interviews, the long stuff, and some of the net map analysis was uh, the emphasis on relationships. Um, if those of you that are familiar with LOM, or I'll just flag this up as something for this afternoon, this organisation was characterised by a large number of people, in a large number of senior people, particularly in the warm golds. We were about relationships. We are about going out there and doing it. We are about saying, we've got the ideas, don't worry too much, just get on and do it. 
This is how we do it. This is how we make it happen within the NHS. These are people that, are, um, that, that um, uh, enable change to happen because they strike the relationship and they get on and do it. And that's a key characteristic of this organisation at the moment. But one of the things that bore out in terms of the interviews was a lot of people in the organisation say, can we please stop and reflect? Can we please just understand what we're doing and share the learning? Can we just stop a moment and just look and do it this way? There's a need in terms of um, the, you know, how we do improvement to maybe just change some of the things we're doing. So some of those sort of cool greens, we're getting very frustrated with all these warm goals. So there's a, what I think, I think one of the key learning points was long for us was just a way of having a common conversation about what it's like to work in this organisation. It, it wasn't threatening, it was a way of recognising who we are, what is the pattern in the organisation, and using LOM as a tool to do that. But also, it validated the interviews, and that's, that's probably where, where the power came out. We knew that we weren't good at demonstrating the value and impact of our work, because we're these wonderful, warm, gold people that are running out there and making it happen, and having significant success. Um, but we weren't able necessarily to turn around to different audiences, either ministers, the department, or back into the NHS and say, and here is the business case that demonstrates it, or here is the value. And it, I suppose it's a bit about the holy grail on organisational design, it's the holy grail on you know, measuring the impact of OD interventions, measuring the impact of um, uh, design interventions. Um, it's, it's, it's something that we're on the cusp of um, creating something that will do that more rigorously for our work, um, what we knew all along is we needed to be better at that, but all these warm girls are running out there just doing it. Um, I say cost, of, uh, cost model to justify more effectively our work. People were telling us we need better management systems and processes. This federation works because we're effective, but actually aren't we duplicating? Couldn't we do it better? Couldn't the processes and systems look better? But let's not, let's not, that's, some camps would say restructure is the solution to the process dilemma. Um, uh, this way of working was saying recognise the patterns and behaviours and then think about the process in the context of those patterns and behaviours uh, rather than the structural solution. Um, the need for clarity, I mean how, how you can, you can never have necessarily ultimate clarity in terms of what's the role of the Department of Health versus the role of the uh, NHS versus the role of the MA. With a million people you'll always be asking that question but we, think, we still keep thinking we can do something better about that. Capturing the learning, uh, a sense that we're reinventing wheels within this federation and there's a better way of capturing the learning, better knowledge systems and processes we can have. This, this may sound simple, I think most organisations would, would say this, but the um, improved meetings and be more respectful of each other's times, I think it's a key feature of an organisation that is uh, up and down the country, 40% of our workforce are mobile, non-office based, are actually based within these organisations. And we lose the plot sometimes in terms of, we'll set up meetings, this is very important, you must come here, it's an important communique, it's an important way of uh, seeing each other. And actually, you know, travelling from Leeds to London, do, you, do we ever build enough time in for that? Do we ever pick the right locations for bringing people together? The basics of sort of respecting each other's time is it's probably more about know who we are and how we work and, and listen to what people are saying about how they can be more effective. And people were saying, in terms of this new organisation, we knew we were coming up for change. Um, we know we need to be leading edge. We think we've been that, but we knew we needed to keep up the pace and keep up the game. Um, actually, what we do recognise is the job we've done in helping, in hand-holding, in helping and sharing the knowledge for this system down here, actually is the responsibility of others. As an organisation, if we're going to be any value to this system for the future, it's because we need to be the people, probably five years down the track, but relevant. We're struggling a lot with the terminology at the moment in terms of common language around what it means to be an innovation organisation. What does it mean to be innovation for improvement? What does it mean to be something that has a pipeline, but the pipeline needs to be relevant? I won't go into that in too much detail. So what do we think we're doing next? Um, we think we're going to use these findings to um, inform the design of the new organisation, but um, being pushed, and, and even the colleagues are great, because there's colleagues who I work with in this, in this organisation who are just phenomenal, world-class experts in 
all sorts of things. But um, uh, Helen was the first person to say, well, hang on a second, why are we restricting this to this organisation? Surely if you just step out of, outside of it and say, what is it that the system requires? What is it this million people require in order to improve things for patients? Mm -hmm. And do it from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Let's not get too bound into just this organisation and the, and, and the space that we occupy. Let's look at the space and work at it from there. So we're, 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 we're thinking that through in terms of how is it, it's relevant for the 750 people of the organisation, but also makes sense of the system, and where do you find the synergy in that? Um, we think the, the long questionnaire seems to be coming into a life of its own in terms of one-to-one -one feedback, but I think that's the result of the change, the change that's happening now. And also, maybe, uh, again, it offers us a tool to think about the capabilities that this new organisation needs to have and how they might be structured, either structure, process, but pattern. How is it you would consider those three things? And these may be long as a, as, a, as a tool for having that conversation. These are sort of some of the things we're thinking about. Last slide. Um, this felt important to me, the sort of what are we learning? What is it that we've learned? We've, been, we've only been doing this six, eight months. Mm -hmm. Since think, September. Since yes. September, yes. yes. I think we've, we've sort of... Yes. <laughs> Eve joined us running. We sort of, ah, <laughs> hang on a second. Well, actually, Eve being the person that's one who's saying, we must do this next, we must do this next. And actually, uh, there's been quite a difference, not a huge difference, I would imagine, but there's a different sort of emphasis in the speed around us, if I feel. But what are we learning? Power of language. Um, how is it that... Uh, I, I suppose this is in every organisation and every sense of organisational development the language that we're using and the need to step, stop and say, I mean this by this, what do you mean? The word process. Uh, you, think, you think it's a sort of, well, people process, um, process in terms of structure, process in terms of um, pattern. Actually, you have to start with, well, what do I mean, what do you mean? A lot of time spent and say, what is the territory we're talking about? Now, that, there's, an imp there's a, a connection there with the impact on the theoretical framework. As I said earlier, we're an organisation that's quite happy to argue the toss over whose theoretical framework is best and how you might bring those together. But actually, I don't think I would have reflected um, the impact that this theoretical framework has had. I wouldn't have, wouldn't have predicted that. And that links in with the language bit as well, because if, as an organisation, we're quite familiar with theor theory and theory and concept and... Um, then actually the language used in those is quite different from one to the next. On a day-to-day -day basis, the, uh, anybody within the organisation would need to understand well, why are we doing this and what is it for. If you can't bring it down to that in a couple of sentences, then we've lost the game. As well as dealing with the group that are saying, but why this theory and why not pull in this, that or the other. It's sort of taking the, the full spectrum and making sense of it as an, as an organisation in language terms, but also being able to do that in, in different ways. The translation to business impact is something I'm, I'm particularly um, working on at the moment in terms of how is it that this organisation or the organisation within the system would understand the value of this work right now and its relationship with um, the, the difference it will make on our business. What difference is it actually making? What was predicted? What's the cost benefit of doing this work? Are we able to answer that question? Because I think the next step of the journey will be an, uh, another conversation I'll have with the board around in there as well will be a, a, a cost-benefit analysis. How is it we would express that cost-benefit analysis? And, as I say, the opportunities for the whole system. It's sort of, you know, duh, we're talking systems, and we're, 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 we're focusing on our organisation, but actually it's stepping back and saying, well, what is the system you're part of and the space you're occupying, and what's the opportunity in terms of evolving the nature of the organisation within that space? Um, we've got, um, uh, we've been using the net map analysis, that's the, uh, my last slide, I'm just conscious of time, what time do you want us to finish by? 12.30, but we can go a little bit over. Okay, maybe Yasir, if you give us sort of five minutes into net map, because I, 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 I heard colleagues talking about net map, we're, we're halfway through loading that in as one of our tools to sort of reinforce and understand the analysis of who we are, and particularly sort of patterns in the organisation. Um, yes, he's done a sort of couple of flip charts to sort of give, uh, explain that tool because I think we've both covered the sort of interviews, um, the long questionnaires, the group feedbacks, the sort of the opportunity for reflect back workshops. But I think this is an important tool in that opportunity to say analyse and understand who it is we are and how we operate. So if yes, here this gives us sort of five minutes on what that looks like. You might be able to see the sort of connection with the other tools that we're using at the moment. Thank you.
Okay, um, due to uh, certain uh, license restrictions on the, the software, I haven't been able to present it to you actually visually. It's, it's quite quite a, uh, an impactful piece of software uh, to, to actually see it in, in person. I've tried to um, <laughs> tried to do my own little artist impression. Um, the concept of net mapping is you take email traffic within the organisation over set periods of time. Scientifically, it's it's useful to get week slots at, with with you know a couple of weeks gap in between, so you, you you've got something to baseline. Um, what you then do is the software maps each individual um, on a whole number of different ways. It ma maps them as individuals. It'll also map them in terms of their teams, um, or in terms of programs within those teams, or any other way that you choose to to to, to map it. It'll then show you the interrelations between those uh, in terms of uh, individuals and in terms of teams, and it can give a thickness to the line depending on, on how much relations are going on, as well as internally within teams. And then you begin to see individuals or, or groups within teams. And, and you, you, you can do this by taking out the names and replacing with job titles so that, or, or particular roles so that you can anonymize it. What we'll do is it will map all those interrelations uh, visually, and, and it, it is an incredibly useful tool in that regard. What it also does is it maps emergent groups. So if you find that certain people within you know, teams suddenly begin to work together, you begin to find patterns within your organization that aren't part of the structure of the organization, per se. So you're, you're no longer restricted to viewing things by an organizational structure. You can begin to see the emergent groups, which you can also identify a kingpins, or what I call that, which is an individual, or, or a node in this particular case, that holds together an emergent group. If you took this person out, the group separates. So it, you, can, it, you can actually act, take the take and add any individual node and then identify how the organization works with or without that, that communicator. What you can also do is identify communication hubs within the organization, either by team or by individual. And what, what we, you do there is you can see either by the number of connections they make, i.e. the num number of reciprocal emails that, that, that happen, or by the number of teams that they communicate with. And you can, you can order it in any which way. And in this particular case, you can begin to identify that, that the red unit within your organization um, seems to be communicating a little bit more frequently than some of the other elements. Um, and from that, you can also identify information conduits. So what you then see is that certain teams or individuals are the only channel of communication between a particular team and other teams or individuals. Um, and that's, that's an important uh, pattern to, of, of flow to actually identify. The way that we, we conducted the, the actual analysis is we took out all emails that were to more than 10 people. So no, none of the bulk emails were, were considered. And the other thing we, we did was we only did reciprocal emails in the analysis. In other words, two-way traffic. What that then, again, did was refine our results to actual communication rather than just dissemination. Um, it, it, it is a very powerful tool. It's something that we, we, we are looking further to exploit. Uh, and I'm sure Eve can, can direct you to, um, to the organization that's uh, based in Australia. Um, and uh, I, think, I think we found it very, very helpful. I think the key thing, just to um, underscore though, this here was it's another way of seeing the patterns within the organisation. And for us particularly, it's a way of saying what do we want to build upon? What is it we understand about who we are and how we, how we behave and how we operate? And what is it we want to build upon? How is it that we would understand that and um, maybe even design that purposefully into either a new organisation or indeed into the transition of our work? It's again, it, it's, as I say, it's... it's, it's one of a number of tools. It's not that we see this as the uh, final piece of the jigsaw, it's just another way of understanding of a pattern within the organisation. 
I'll stop there. No. Is, yes. Was that just for the modernisation agency that you've done it, or for the whole NHS? Oh no, just for the modernisation right. agency. <laughs> that's just within the 780,000 yeah. yes. yeah. yeah. people. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's scalable. It yeah. is. Yeah. It's stunning yes. stuff. Yes. It's, it's great, but the danger is you oh, get so lost long and hard in the. Yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, one thing I must emphasise is that we don't look at content. Yeah. Uh, we don't even look at the um, the subject of the email because yeah. there are a lot of ethical issues with mm. that. All we look at is the fact of exchange. That's all. Mm. Yeah. I think that's very yeah. important. Yeah, it is. Can I just ask a question? Yeah. Um, I think it sounds fascinating. I'm also thinking something for you, email, is another thing. Yes. Yeah. 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 So something like just go up to the desk and say something. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. absolutely. But, but that, that actually, that th those around. results actually a actually match in because, for, what, for example, there are a couple of small teams like technologies and health, which are a, a tiny team that all sit connected to each other. And suddenly you find this big hole in their, in their communications there. But there are, there are factors that you can, you can add in. And the other thing as well is that email communication isn't necessarily a good thing. You know, there's, 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 there's stuff there that, that also you can point out and say, well, hang on a second, these guys are just sending bulk loads of emails. Is this really the best way? to communicate within an organization. Are there alternatives? So this is, like, like Caroline said, this is just one tool, um, which gives one view. Um, and it can't be the, the, the sole or central mm. focus of, of, of your analysis. And, and you Let triangulate it with yeah, other yes, tools. That's yeah. right. So you can sit down with a group of individuals and interview them. And if you saw on, um, certainly in Rolls-Royce, you know, we had a section on communication. And you, know, you get an idea that that this particular group of individuals, they'd rather pick up the phone and walk down the corridor. Yeah. Yeah. You'd then look at the net map and you'd see that they'd have very few email communications yeah. and one thing supported the other. Yeah. So very Absolutely. Isn't yeah. it a scientific way of proving the other grapevine? I mean, surely you know you've got your few lines of communication, but all this is telling you is that the grapevine's alive and kicking. Exactly. Mm. But, but the, there's, yeah. there's more power to it in, in some sense, in that you, yes, that's that. That's very much the case, but when you when you're trying to provide arguments and you're trying to provide business cases and you're trying to reach people who need the analysis behind it, you've got a little bit of additional argument. So, like like you you guys were presenting earlier and saying, you know, you, you've got these people who are intuitive, or you've got people who who need to actually visualise what is happening within the organisation, and you've got something which does that very smartly. It's, it's a way of getting a message across. Mm -hmm. We've got a question. Well, it follows on from what other people have said. Um, can I just pick on the practicality? Uh, it seems very, very useful. But how do you get over the, uh, the big brother yeah. uh, aspect ah. of this? Because in a real life situation, people are actually worried about what are you really Absolutely. looking at? Absolutely. And, and, couldn't agree with that more. And I suppose particularly, uh, we wouldn't have known that um, in last year that we would be where we are now in terms of right, an organisation that's going to stop and the creation of a new one. And of course, it, some people are, would, would look at NetMap tool outside of anything else we're doing, or purpose, or um, uh, the, the, the journey that we're on, and say, well, you're just deciding who's going to be in the new organisation. This is a new recruitment process. This is a new selection process. You map it in with LOM, and you've got your, well, you have to be a, this, this colour with this sort of communication style, and there's your new recruitment process. I mean, it, it, it is apps, that's exactly where, where we are. Yeah. I think all we, all we can um, do is um, to keep reinforcing and actually demonstrating what we're using this analysis for. At the end of the day, uh, as long as we continue to show that we're not using this for any other purpose than what, we've d what we set out in the beginning for, that, that's the only demonstration we can give, and reinforcing the message, leaders and champions, that, that that's, that is what we are doing. But we're right there, absolutely. There, 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 are, there are two ways, sorry, there are, two, there are basically two ways of, of approaching this as well, which is one is where you, um, you, you before you do the exercise, you get written consent from every single person involved, which just is the clean clean way of doing it. Um, we, we had, we're a little bit time restricted, but what we did was we anonymized it. Um, and in the sense that you know you can't take any one individual and map them to a particular particular node. Um, and you know I only got the information 
from my, t my, my IT people and my teams um, when I gave them the assurance that this, you know, we, it is being used as an analysis tool, it is not being identified down to, to an individual and it's not part of the recruitment or employment process that we're going to be going through. And, and, and their, their trust in me to, you know, was, was part of what made it possible. We went through a similar thing, you know, sort of in industry, uh, that, you know, obviously with the unions and everything else. Mm -hmm. and, and we've got um, a policy within the company which says we monitor email traffic, not mm -hmm. the content, but mm -hmm. you know, in terms of knowing how, how big your network needs to be and how big your file yeah. server needs to be. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to monitor email traffic to say, you know, how many interactions are we getting a day? And all we did was actually use that data. Mm. And you can actually, on, uh, on NetLab, you can also put in telephone traffic as well. Yeah, yes. So as long as you record the telephone numbers, you can put that in as well. Um, and, and we didn't have any problems at all. Mm -hmm. But it is a matter of trust. Yes. That's why I, I wanted to make sure that the ethical aspect was very, very clear. Because without that, you cannot do this kind of, of work. Um, certainly not as part of, of, of a research project like, like we're doing. And are people convinced? I mean, I don't know, if I was going for a reorganisation or finding out that the organisation isn't going to exist for many years, uh, it'd be very destabilising that even initially, about, because you said you got people to sign up for it, but I might sign up because I've got to sign up, and I dare not because I would be seen as I think that the, the, the proof will always be in what you do with it yes. and we, what we're continuing to do, to do is to show what we are doing with it and what we're not doing with it. I, d I think we, you just, we need to front up that that is, that is a feeling um, uh, within the organisation and how are we going to respond to that and show the right leadership in that situation. Yeah. Transparency, yeah. Oh, yeah, just being up front. Um, just like a quick comment on that, I've just written an article recently for, for a small newsletter. Um, and it started with uh, this intrigue about this guy from Phones for You last year who banned people from using email because he said, A, it takes twice as long to uh, use them, ten times longer composing stuff than just talking to people. Things, you know, that in itself is quite interesting. And um, there's also some other work from LSD here about um, bars, about face to face contact mm -hmm. and actually what happens there, which is not only. Sort of simultaneous transmission of you know, body language and all the rest of it, mm -hmm. but also um, sort of qualification for um, uh, basically you put yourself in a loop where actually you are uh, privileged with a different level of trust. Um, and the great contrast is if you send somebody spam email, they don't get any respect at all, mm -hmm. whereas actually if you put yourself out and make an investment in a face to face meeting, a different kind of transaction takes place. And um, that seems to be a limitation. I mean, in a sense, what you're doing is like this sort of, uh, you know, before you crack the code, you know, you know there's radio traffic going on with the submarines in the Atlantic, you don't know what it's saying. Mm -hmm. So I can see there's, a, there's an element there, but in itself, it's not giving anything about the, the quality. Um, no, that's not at all. So uh, I, I feel sort of troubled by it in, in, in that sense, although there are some communication but, Like Caroline yeah. said, it, it's, it's entirely within the context yeah. of, of the other tools yeah. that they but use. Th there was a wider thing there, because actually, if we were talking about the Rolls-Royce case going from uh, Matrix to Q, you, you almost seem to be lost in phase space with the, uh, the modernisation agency being atomised. I, I, what do you quite get from your talk mm -hmm. is the, um, where, the, uh, uh, where all these people are going to end up, what's going to happen with this, uh, you know, if the Queen Bee is gone, what happens mm -hmm. to the rest of the hive? How, how is this thing going to work between being a centralised unit and being devolved somehow? I suppose what, what's it, left and what's, what's being lost in that process? Yeah, I, um, I, I suppose if I talk about assumption and um, I'm glad you said that at the end there, the sort of what's, what's being lost. Our intention is not to lose anything. This is not a cost-cutting cost -cutting drive. If uh, we, will, we will fail, I mean the big we as well as we as an organisation, if as a result of localising our work in this way, dissolving this organisation, we do not continue and make improvement even better as a result of this phase of what, what's happening. Um, so with that as sole purpose and clarity uh, about that, that being the journey, um, we're right in the middle of saying, well, what does transition of our work look like? 
every single one of those activity areas, including Cancer Services Collective, you know, highly successful areas. Um, what, what does the work look like in transition? How, how is it that these, we would recognise these people localised and the budget associated with them localised in the NHS? Some of, the, some of our work, though, is, is already um, happens and is structured deliberately in such a way that it looks like that. And what you're actually doing is just sort of shifting the name on the on the contract of employment, effectively. Um, but you can't disregard the, uh, I suppose, the, the psychological contract that you're breaking with an organisation and setting up with another organisation. And perhaps that's the territory that we're dealing with, is saying that that is the contract that we're dealing with in the context of in localising work and making improvement better. It's a sort of centre of excellence at the moment, yeah. where you bring if you atomise them, um, is, is that... Well, I suppose uh, I it's... I've understood what's happening. Under, well, no, 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 absolutely. It's, um, I suppose it's saying bringing them together. Well, what's the pattern of the organisation at the moment? Well, they come together without having the name organisation agency above it anyway. They come together because the work attracts them and actually pulls them versus being pushed. Um, and you don't have to be an employee of the modernisation agency to be an improver of the NHS system. Um, so perhaps it's about taking the boundaries and the titles off and saying, well, how does it work currently and how do we make it better as a result of something up here which says it's not going to look like that, the numbers aren't going to look like that, It'll, we'll shift it around the system a bit. There's and it's truly shifting it around the system. There's another thing that we're, we're doing in the, in the, at, at this moment as well, uh, partly to capture all the legacy information that we've, we've been building all, for the last three years, etc but also to, to live beyond whatever organisational structure the modernisation agency may, may be. Uh, we've created a hub, a portal of innovation knowledge um, and improvement knowledge um, where groups like the Cancer Services Collaborative, other groups, etc., can migrate their content into an area which is non-organisationally tied, necessarily. So there is, let's say, a, a portal or a platform which will operate with access to people globally who have an interest in improvement uh, in, in the health service um, and innovation and, and tie them together and help them find each other. Um, and again, you don't have to be a member of any particular organization to participate in that. Um, that's one of our, our key projects at the moment. Um, and just to touch on, on, on a couple of the, your other earlier comments, um, totally agree with you in terms of the limitations of email. Um, at the end of the day, people are sort of like some arbitrary figure of 11% of, of our communication is verbal. Um, when you are on email, you lose the, the nuance of tone and, inter, and, and pitch and intonation. Um, when you're on the phone, you lose the, 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 the nuance of body language and eye contact. The, there are limitations. It has its uses within an organization. It has a use. Understanding where that fits in and how you want to use it is just as important and, and this provides one of those mechanisms. So uh, we recognise that. Have I looked at, sorry, patterns of change? No, not yet. No, I mean, that, 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 is, an, that is an opportunity, I suppose, that software will present. I was going to say, ask, ask Anna, you know, she's, she's, she works with, with people in, in the don't. NHS all the time. They don't, but one of the things that um, we change the language to deal with the audience where we're trying to get the message across, mm. and, and that can vary from department to department. The certain words that you keep, I mean, modernisation is yeah. quite a dirty word out there in the mm. NHS, so you don't talk about modernisation. If uh, people will understand business cases, but if you wanted to Why do you want these resources? We need to put a paper together to demonstrate that this is what we need to achieve the benefits for patients. So you, you, you just mm. avoid some of the language deliberately. Yeah. It 
depending on the audience. But it, it is on the audience, and it's understanding. It, it's in fact a, a point that he made. It's, it's finding the logic in the complexity, mm. and then just making sure when you know what the logic mm. is, mm. apply the language mm. to that logic. Yeah. And it's, it, I mean, it's sometimes I cover a, a big area, and I can be talking about the same <coughs> thing in a different way throughout the whole day, but I'm giving the same message. Mm. But that's about understanding the context and the history mm. of, of the organisation and the people you're dealing with. And that takes time. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll break now because a lot of these questions, I think, at the end of today, we can bring together with um, and look at both Rolls-Royce um, Marine and the Modernization Agency. Um, first of all, please join me to thank Caroline and Yasir and Anne.